So the purpose of today's class is just to go back and recap a few of the details that we've been working on the past few weeks. There is a bit of a new section that has, which is obviously not in the midterm, as I said on the website here, because the midterm is going to come at up to on Monday. So today's class is some review elements from, from uh, the five weeks. A little bit of new stuff, and then I'm going to leave some time at the end for questions that you might have um, as you start to prepare for more. I do want to mention two things. Firstly, there's some uncollected assignments at the front, assignment one and two. Assignment three solutions have been posted to the website. Uh, the TAs obviously don't have time to grade that before the return, given the short time frame. But the full solutions are there for you to go through. And then thirdly, uh, Witness here has offered some time to um, have a review session in JHP 342. So if you have a chance on Thursday, and he is going to be there between 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. So Witness here is kind of, this is his own, own idea, he's kind of just offered to do that out of uh, his extra time. So if you have questions, for the midterm, that's a good spot, a good place to meet. And I hope it uh, works with your time tables. Um, if not, please email the TAs and see if they can arrange something else. But this is generally voluntary that they're doing this. Um, if you're trying to reach me on Thursday, unfortunately, I'm off campus the entire morning. I've got meetings with the professional engineers of Ontario in Toronto entire Thursday, so I will only be showing up on campus pretty much for the midterm and my stats class in the afternoon. Um, so the best way, if you do have any last before it, is to contact the TAs first. So let's uh, take a look at some review of just a, basically putting up a recipe almost for solving the problems we considered over the last few weeks. And if you've noticed, that it's in the handout that we looked at last time from Dr. Marlin's handout. So, you might want to call it a recipe. Um, also say, see um, the, the Marlin handout. But the key points there are, is when we work with these problems in process control, the first step will be to write up the first principles of the Okay, so that's your mass and energy balances that you you have. So we call it it's a mass balance, an overall mass balance, individual molar balances. So if you've got more than one species, you can do a molar balance for each species, or you can do an energy balance for the system. Like we said we almost certainly see some non-linear terms in there. So the next step then is to linearize the non-linear terms. We looked at that last class in detail as well as in higher classes. Next we create deviation variables. subtracting from steady state. Once you have those deviation variables in place, now you simplify that equation and then you can go ahead and take the class transforms. So you've converted at this stage, you've gone from the time domain to the S domain. So step three takes you from the time domain to the S domain. And we do that because solving that ODE in the time domain is often extremely difficult. We have to use integrating factors. If we're lucky, we can do that. Most cases, though, those ODEs are, are messy and complex if we cannot solve them analytically. The ODEs now, once converted to the Laplace transform version, then take the form where we get a 
transfer function which has an output and an input. And I'm going to just write this generically because the symbols will vary every time. So it will be an output as a function of the s variable divided by the input. And that's going to have on the right hand side then the process that you're considering. So identify your output variable, identify your input variable. That's, so that's an important step there in step five is what is my output, what is my input, and then everything else is on the right hand side. So that POS defines your process. The sixth step then is to specify your input, because where we're heading is we'd like to know what that output looks like in the time domain. So to do that, you find your input, and you have to do that in the Laplace domain. So if, you, if your input is a step function, you have to rewrite the step function as an input in the Laplace domain. Input is a sinusoid or a ramp. Convert that input in the time domain over to the Laplace domain. But uh, seventhly, once you know your input, you can multiply out and solve and simplify for your output. So the output of S is then equal to your process transfer function G of S times your input. And then the last step is to convert that output back to the time domain. So it goes to find our output in the time domain. Okay, so that's our goal is to achieve that output in the time domain, and that's done by taking the inverse of the transform of the output. So step eight you, you've seen so far in some, several of the assignments is not actually done. Because when you look at the output S in the seventh step over here, we can often tell already without converting this output of S, we can look at it and the characteristics of that output function tell us what it's going to do in the time domain. For example, we can see whether there will be oscillations. We can use the initial value and final value theorem on this output of S to tell what the steady state and the initial value are going to be. So often we don't have to do step eight. Simply by inspecting the equation we're, we have achieved in step seven, we can tell quite a bit about what our system is going to do. So many times you'll see going on in this course, we won't actually do step eight. We're going to be very comfortable at understanding what the time domain is doing just by looking at step seven without going to the time domain. So perhaps let me just finish this up here and write that step seven to eight takes you from the S domain back to the T domain. We may not fully do that. So what I just want to come back to is point number six quickly. Point number six works really well if you have a simple input, so a ramp or sinusoid or a step, but last uh, or two classes ago we considered composite inputs, inputs that are made up of more than one function. And that's what I just quickly want to recap again. Uh, there were some questions at the end of that lecture and we need to understand what that P96 does. As well, the other reason for me coming back to this point is that it reviews the topic of dead time, which is another new concept that we learned about last week. So, so this is going to um, achieve two goals with one example. And the example I'm going to consider is one that you've seen in the tutorials before, and that is a ramp that starts at time 25, so it starts at time zero, I should say, at a value of 25. I'm just going to modify it a little bit to make it a, a bit more interesting. We're going to ramp up at a rate of two units per minute. So we're going to achieve a value then 
of 145 after the time of 60 minutes. So ramping up at two units per minute. And then I'm going to stay steady for a period of time and drop back down again to 25. I'm going to come back to where I started off and then continue on. So these sorts of strange inputs appear in practice. In many batch processes, we'll often ramp up for a period of time and stay steady and then come back down to where we started off. And so this green function then we'll call f of t. Now we will simplify this and make our life a little bit easier by actually working in deviation form. Okay, so we'll create a new function f dash of t and let's take a look at how we do that. Well deviation form we call simply says subtract off your steady state and assuming we're starting at steady state that means we subtract off that value of 25. So you can simply rewrite this RAM function as now starting at zero. Ramps up now to 120 this time. So deviation simply says subtract 25 from everything. We're staying constant for a period of time, up to 90 minutes. Right at the previous time. So we at time 90 we're going to step down. So notice when I do deviation variables, my x-axis stays exactly the same. It's only the y-axis that simply shifts. And that's why deviation variables work so well. And then we come back down and then we keep going. So we come back down to zero. So let's call this transformed version, we'll call this f dash of t, to emphasize the same deviation form. And that deviation form we could quite easily write as f dash of t, we could write it as a composite that we're simply ramping up at 2t or times 0 to 60. And from time 60 to time 90, we're simply at 120. So it's 120 from 60 to time 90. And from time 90 onwards, we're at zero again. So at zero for the rest of the time. Our challenge with composite inputs is that if you take a look at this, define your input of s, that's a single function. Okay? What I've written over here is three separate functions. So our goal with this part, with step five, is to take these three separate portions, this ramp, the steady state, and then that, uh, sorry, that ramp, that flat line, and then the, the jump back down to steady state, convert those three separate functions to a single input as a function of s. So that's where we want to go, is to find f dash of x. So my aim here is to go from this to f dash of x. How do I do that? Well, we saw that last time. The intermediate step is to write f dash of t as a, in a single line. So in the tutorial, we had a chance to do this. And you can certainly try it out here again. I would like you to take a few minutes, work with the person next to you, and write out f dash of t is equal to, and you should only have a single equation over there, a single line. You can't break it up into the three parts as I've done over there. It's going to involve time delays. So give that a go. First term is 2t.
dash of s. Take a Laplace transform of those three terms then. First term, when we take go to Laplace transform, get dash of x would be two over s squared. Right, so it's a ramp function. So two over s squared. Yeah. Yes. No. Yes. Still waking up. Yes. Yeah. Next term. Maybe just do a little bit of a quick recap here on the side before we try to understand the next term. So recall that we define time delays as follows. We said if we have some output y, that's simply a delay of x. So x is my function delayed by theta units. We call that y. We multiply by the switch so that that function is 0 up to time theta. So the thinking here is, I know what my function is. If I'd like to see that function simply just delayed by a certain time, that's y. <coughs> so x is my input, y is my output delayed by theta units. If we take the Laplace transform of this, we call that y of s. That function x in the time domain, so not x of t minus theta, but function x of t, so what I'm referring to is lowercase x, we normally go to capital X. But if I observe a function x simply delayed by theta units, I can just write that function in the Laplace domain x of s multiplied by e to the minus theta x. So that's my Laplace of that. And if I want to go backwards, my inverse Laplace. So both both uh, are related that way. So with that in mind then, what do we notice here? Let's take a look at that first line. y of t is equal to x of t minus theta times the step function. Do we recognize that format over here? This is in the second term. Recognize that structure exists over there. So what is... What is the term I write over here? Okay, so no prizes for guessing that there's going to be a e to the minus 60s, but what goes in front of it? Um, I've got in brackets, I've got 2, uh, I've got 2 over s squared minus, and in brackets, uh, 2 over s squared minus 120 over s. Oh yeah, yeah so you, you've gone further on. Uh, no, in front of e to the negative 60. I'm not sure where the 120 would come from. <laughs> That's quite okay. We want to make mistakes here in class so we don't make mistakes later. Yeah. 2 over s. 2 over s. Sorry, say 2 over s and then e to the negative 60. Okay, so 2 over s squared? No, Just s? <laughs> Okay, so why is it s squared now? Oh. It's 2t. Okay, so this is where we want to get clear up our misconceptions. It's 2 over s squared, and it's um, minus. Okay, so let's take a look why it's 2 over s squared. Again, another easy misconception to have. 
take a look back at our original function over here and compare it to the first line on the board over on the right. So it says x, the function x of t minus theta. What is my function over here? Oh, I, yeah, what is my function over here? 2t. So my function x is equal to 2t. If I simply write that function delayed by 60 minutes, so x of t minus theta is equal to 2t minus 60. So wherever we see a t, we replace it by t minus 60. So what I need to write over here in this area is the Laplace transform of my function x. So what I need over here is my x of x. My x is 2t. Okay, so what goes over here is 2 over s squared. A few confused faces, but work through that. Maybe talk with your neighbor next to you. If your neighbor understands what it is, how to do it, discuss and convince the person next to you, and I'm going to recap it again. Is it e to the negative 60s? Is it e to the negative 60s? Yeah. 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 Minus 120s over there, but what goes in front of that? Minus 120 over s. Okay, so this time my function is simply a constant. So the Laplace transform of the constant is the one over s. Yeah. Isn't time today all your time? Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so you can do a little bit of simplification on that, um, but otherwise that's a pretty good way to leave it. Okay. So that's my Laplace transform of that input. And we can do this for arbitrary inputs, simply adding up individual base functions and delaying them in time. So this is a good way to understand time delays as well as to develop constant of inputs. The next uh, topic I quickly want to cover and touch on is that of second order systems. So we've seen this come up a little bit in the assignments. We haven't discussed it formally in class, but I do want to just quickly introduce a little bit of theory and we're going to see this in the next few weeks. So let's just go back and call this second topic second order systems. And what I mean by that is systems where if we look at the ODE, we could write it as some coefficient d2 and d2y and dt squared. So we've got a second order derivative plus another coefficient d1 times dy by dt. So there's my first order ODE plus some constant d0 and a function of t. So many systems are second order in nature, where that order refers to the highest power in the time derivative. So some variable y as a function in the second derivative. And then on our left hand side, I'm just going to write a, a simplified version. Let's consider just a single coefficient n and an input x dash of t. So I'll just make a note here, y dash and x dash are deviation points. We've got the d2y by dt squared, we've got a dy dash by dt, and we've got a y dash. And on the left, on the right hand side, we have an x dash. 
So there's my ODE. And in Laplace terms, we could rewrite this as D2S squared plus D1S plus D0 all multiplied by Y dash. So the D1, the coefficient multiplied by S, you're very comfortable with that now. That's from your tables. But if you look on your tables again, there's a row for higher order derivatives. So second order, third order derivatives. And all that happens is your first order derivative is s to the power 1, your second order derivatives are s to the power 2, and so forth. Okay, so we don't need to derive that, we can just delete the table, and it follows in that natural way. If I take the Laplace on the right hand side, I'll get n times x dash of x. Now I can go rewrite this equation and solve it in the form of a transfer function. I'm rewriting it as y dash over x dash. You'll see why the notation makes sense. So go ahead and, and do that while I clean the boards. Okay, so the transfer function then y dash of x over s dash of x, x dash of s is equal to some numerator coefficient. And in my denominator, I've got d2s squared plus d1s1 plus d0. Yeah. Could be the the um, products of two transfer functions multiplied together in the second order, or is it second order to the transfer we can get it from both ways. So the question is, is this from two first order transfer functions multiplied together, or is this from a naturally occurring second order ODE system? Either one applies. Okay, so next time I'll show you how you can plug in your first order ODE into another ODE and you'll get a second order ODE. Um, you've seen that in a math course already, but these systems arise naturally in, in many cases, and I'll show you a practical example in a minute. So if we have that as my transfer function, the numerator coefficients and the denominator coefficients, what we'll often do is we'll introduce a little bit of new notation here. So in GP4, we'll write that as y dash of s over x dash of s. And we'll introduce a numerator gain, k. So gain is always going to be k. In my denominator, I'm going to be able to factor that out in one of two ways. Either I can factor it out as two first order transfer functions multiplied together with a tau 1 and a tau 2. Or I can write it often, uh, always as y dash of x over x dash of x. I can also write it as k and just have a single time constant, tau squared s squared plus two times this Greek letter, cal chi, psi I should say. So we can rewrite it in that, this, this method. So uh, this letter is psi, the Greek letter psi. Other textbooks will use a symbol that I cannot possibly draw. It looks something like that. Um, eta. Or zeta, I should say. Um, but I'm going to stick with this one. Dr. Marlin uses this one in his book. So we can write it in either form. Either form works. And they're always interchangeable, and you can change between one form and the other by recognizing the following relationship that tau squared is equal to the product of tau 1, tau 2, and then 2 times psi tau is equal to tau 1 plus tau 2. allows you to convert between the two forms. 
And I'll also note here that the roots in the denominator can be written as follows. If you factored it into this form here on the whiteboard, uh, the roots can be found as s equals minus eta, uh, minus psi, I should say, plus or minus psi squared minus 1 over 2 times tau. Root of what form? If you factor it in one with the With the psi. If you've got it in this form over here, you already have the roots. Okay. So in this form over here, the roots are s is equal to minus 1 over tau 1 and s is equal to minus 1 over tau 2. Okay, so that form gives you the roots pretty much straightforwardly. The second form, you have to do a little bit more work. This is from the quadratic formula, just using this notation up here. So in the square root, wouldn't it be like minus 4? It's, because uh, notice here this coefficient is 2 times psi times tau. So it's factored out from there. And it's, there's a lot of simplification. So one thing then, you know, this is the only point I want to emphasize here is that depending on what those roots look like, we'll get different behavior in the system. So this is this concept of underdamped, overdamped, and critically damped. So depending on the nature of the roots, it determines the system's response. So what we'll say then is that when psi is equal to, sorry, greater than 1, we call the system is overdamped. Okay, and this is what most chemical plants will exhibit in overdamped behavior. Okay, so the roots are real and unequal. So those two roots in the denominator are real values and unequal. If psi is exactly equal to 1, we say it's critically damped. And then the roots are real and identical. Okay, so tau 1 is equal to tau 2. So in that very unusual case where tau 1 is exactly equal to tau 2, the system critically damped, and if that psi value is a value between 0 and 1, we call the system underdamped. And looking at the equation for the roots, you can start to see we get complex roots occurring. So we say the roots are complex, and they will always occur in complex conjugate pairs. So your roots will always be of the form S is equal to some value A plus B times I, the complex number I. Tau 1 is tau 2. S is your variable that you're solving for. It's like your undefined x. Yeah, I'm going to show you what it looks like. You need to see a picture of this. Okay, so this is this image is posted on the course website. The second one, the third equal and unequal. Yeah. It means that 
No, Ta one and Ta two can very easily be different values. But if they are multiplied together, they still have Tau squared. Tau squared is equal to Ta one times Tau two. <laughs> so we're talking about Tau one and Tau two, not a single Tau. So here's a here's a helpful image that shows you what undamped logarithm looks like. And perhaps if you want to simplify that diagram in your notebook, one way you can write it is the following, is we're considering here the time domain response of y for, let's just consider x to be a step input. So if I give, it, give the system a step input, what I will see is the system will steady out at some final value, and if it's overdamped, we'll get that sort of response. If the system is underdamped, you'll get oscillatory behavior. And if the system is critically damped, you get something that's just a little bit in between. So Overdamped response, I'm oh, sorry, it looks as in the red curve, underdamped response will exhibit oscillation. So this is underdamped. You can recognize it better as the logo on the course website. And then the final one is critically damped, which is says it just does, it almost looks like the first order response. It basically gets to that set point in the minimum amount of work, the minimum amount of deviation. It will return back to that, or will get back to that. So this is critically that. So one, the, this terminology of damping comes from the area of spring. So when you went back, think back to your physics course, you spoke about springs. The equation for a spring with a weight attached to it is a second order ODE. Okay? And you may or may not have considered it in the terms of damping, critically damped, overdamped, and underdamped. But one way you can see that is what do we want from our processes? How would we like our process to behave? Think of process control. We want to get to our targets. Which of those three responses would you like to see? Critically damped would get you there just in the minimum amount of work. Underdamped may not be acceptable because you're going to overshoot your targets and then get back to it eventually with a lot of oscillation. And under overdamped means you're just simply taking longer than necessary to get back to target. So, like, take a look at this door. I'm going to close the door. There's a spring on the door. Right? And then tell me if you think this door is critically damped, over damped, or under damped. So when you hear that bang, shut, 
that's excess energy. Right? So that if the door frame weren't there, the door actually would have come into the room. So that door is under that. If we tighten up the spring on that door, we can make it to be over that or critically damped. Okay? The same thing for our chemical processes. We're going to examine then the second order parameter psi and tell them whether our process is over that, under that, or critically damped. What you're going to see where this comes in is, remember in the tutorial you derived the transfer function for a feedback control loop? So even if you're controlling a first order process, the moment you've got a feedback controller in there, that overall picture you drew often has second order characteristics. So your control loop with the process combined can exhibit under damped behavior, critically damped behavior, or over damped behavior. So we're going to look at this value psi as a way to tell what our process is. Okay. As an example for you to try out, this is obviously not in the midterm because we said today's class is not covered there, but take a look back at the final example in assignment three. Remember there was an S squared plus two S plus five term in the denominator. Take a look at that and see whether you can determine if it's over damped, under damped, or critically damped. And what the roots of that denominator are. So I've got two, three minutes here for questions. I'll also remain here for any time that's needed to answer anyone's questions.